Welcome to the 2021 Big Sky Ideas Fest. I'm Joe O'Connor with the Outlaw Partners, and I'm honored to kick off this year's event with this exclusive interview. Big Sky Bravery is a nonprofit organization dedicated to giving back to our country's elite service members who give us their all. Today, I'm joined by two of the men who make this happen. Josh McCain is the founder and president of Big Sky Bravery, and he will be delivering a talk uh, you don't want to miss at our TEDx Big Sky event um, Saturday night, January 30th at 6 p.m. Jeremy Keller is a master sergeant with the Army Rangers and currently a senior military science instructor for Washington State University's Army Ranger Office, Army, excuse me, Army Reserve Office Training Corps. He's not only the inspiration behind the program, he's also Josh's brother-in-law. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me this evening. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, I'd like to start with you. You know, first off, thank you for your service. Um, you are a decorated U.S. Army Ranger of 20 years. Uh, what uh, battalions did you serve in? So I, when I first joined, I went down to Fort Benning, Georgia, went through my indoctrination program, and then was assigned to 3rd Ranger Battalion in May of 2002 and served there until 2014, where I then PCS over to 175 on the east coast of Georgia and spent uh, 36 months there. Wow. How many total deployments did you say you had? Um, in total, I had 18 outside of any training deployments. 18? 18. 18 to, correct. Wow. And, you know, you mentioned a couple. Where else did, did were you sent? Uh, primarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then we would do numerous training deployments all throughout the world. Um, Germany, Italy, went to Israel for a little bit. I'd gone out of Thailand. So. Mm, wow, that, that's, that's amazing. You know, Josh, special forces, uh, you know, make up about 2% of the U.S. on forces. How elite are these soldiers? I mean, just from the snippets I've been able to spend with them for the last six years, um, they're America's finest. And uh, uh, it's not just from a physical uh, characteristic. I mean, the, the intellect behind these individuals is, is something I've never seen before. And that's, you know, work at, in uh, New York City. That's, you know, every other private sector I've been involved with. I'd, I'd put these guys up against anybody um, in any way, shape or form. I mean, they truly selfless warriors that um, sacrifice every single part of their body, their mind, body and soul to keep our nation safe and free. Um, as far as their training goes, I don't really have too much of an idea of that. Jeremy would know more on that, but um, I can tell you that uh, from the stories that I've, that I've heard and uh, my interactions with them the last six years, um, I'm damn glad they're on our side, not somebody else's. Sure. Well, there's some pretty staggering statistics out there uh, related to, to warm to um, special uh, forces. Um, could you share some of those with us? Yeah. Um, you know, I think better in, in better way to serve, you know, what your, your, your audience need to you know, understand them. And, uh, you know, it's very sensitive what we do, especially the role that we play working with these elite units. Um, you know, soft just makes up uh, 2% of the armed forces. Um, last year alone, they were deployed to 76% of the nations on this planet. 85% um, of these individuals experience significant uh, traumatic brain injuries just from training alone. Um, average calendar year, these guys are gone. These guys and gals are gone 280 days out of the year, whether that's deployments um, mixed in with training. Um, the ninety percent divorce rate in some of the soft communities that we work with. I mean, it's it's, it's heartbreaking. Uh, it's a volunteer service. Uh, we never thank them for what they do because that's not what they're here for. But we're damn sure proud of them. And uh, the uh, the amount of work that they that they do on our behalf, and you know, the load that they carry on their shoulders, um, is something I'll never be able to comprehend. Certainly. I don't know that any of this could. Uh, you know, Josh, you left, a, you left a good job in New York City to start Big Sky Bravery. Um, when was that? And walk us through, 
you know, your thinking and that experience. Yeah, I, uh, had a pretty interesting life. Um, New York was, you know, it's kind of that unicorn that a lot of people chase. You know, I grew up here in Montana, um, in a small town called Three Forks. And, uh, when I got there, I really saw the hustle and bustle of, uh, not the city, the city, there's quiet parts of the city that you don't, people never talk about, but just the, the, the grind there and how fast paced everybody is. And they want an answer quick. Um, I always felt like I had something to prove and, um, I, the only way I could justify it was money, uh, selfishly and, during my time in New York, uh, my brother-in-law was coming back from his 14th deployment, and um, it was just kind of, you know, I'm not going to give my TED talk away, but it was an awakening, and that's the theme of the TED the TEDx speak next next, next week. So, um, you know, self-interest aside, you know, outside of money and career, it's like what what out there needs our help? And based off these statistics that I just shared and Jeremy's stories and. Um, you know, some of the stuff we've gone through the last six years with Big Sky Bravery, I'm damn sure glad I made that jump. Uh, I don't really look at it as a sacrifice. I looked at it as something that uh, was needed to be done. And uh, I'm glad that I had a, a role model like Jeremy, um, you know, to shoot for and uh, do something in honor for a guy like him rather than somebody else. I mean, it was pretty easy when you see what he's doing overseas on our behalf for me to quit my job. My wife and I had to quit our jobs in New York and move back to Bozeman to start Big Sky Bravery. Uh, so the least we could do for for somebody like him. Yeah, absolutely, Jeremy. When did you when did you learn of Josh's efforts? He um, he actually called me one night and proposed the idea to me, and you know, kind of asked me what what my thoughts were, and you know, if there was anything like that. And I I told him that if he was able to kind of get this thing going, and you know, that for the cogs to catch, it would it would change lives. And the proof is in the pudding with the survey results that Josh has received and, you know, the testimonials that we get out from the recipients as they come out. Like, Big Sky Bravery is changing, changing lives and change, changing marriages. Um, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be the impetus behind it, but this is way bigger than one person. And I, I think Josh can truly attest to that. Yeah, Josh, talk, speak to that for a second, you know, way bigger than one person. Um, in the last six years, we brought in over 200, um, not just operators, um, but wives as well. Uh, we, we had our first wives task force last August, um, composed of six wives from operators who had attended our task forces in years past. Uh, we also have, uh, two times a year, we do a female initiative, um, you know, I didn't know there was females in these units, and um, I didn't even know these units existed until I started this thing. Uh, and uh, the amount of work that these people do, uh, male or female, um, it's heroic. At, at you know, I don't know any way to decide. You know, and if I wouldn't have done this six years ago because of Jeremy. Um, you know, I, I don't know where a lot of people would be right now. And I don't look for any type of gratification or, um, you know, this is no self-interest project for me. This is simply, uh, we saw a gap in, um, in national interest towards, uh, American service members. When I started Big Sky Baby, there was over 45,000 nonprofit organizations dedicated to veterans. Um, when I called Jeremy, he couldn't name a single one that was given back to them in the active duty community. And uh, now there's over 60,000 nonprofits for veterans. And I'm not knocking any nonprofit veteran out there, but I am saying that uh, we need to be proactive as Americans and uh, looking at our nation's war fighters, especially those who have done, you know, 8, 10, 15, 18 combat deployments. And one thing Jeremy missed to say is those are all in special operations. Jeremy never deployed conventionally. He literally got into special operations very early on in his career and deployed 18 straight times, um, you know, against the global war on terror. So for me, it's just saying uh, this is the longest active war in American history. The same people are still fighting it. We've had guys that come in for a task force that uh, were there on, you know, the invasion of Iraq, and they're still fighting in 
you know, um, horrific places across the globe with a gun on their shoulder. Um, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Gray hair, gray beards, you know, stone cold American patriot killers. And, uh, we need to be proactive as Americans in supporting these individuals and knowing that there's efforts carried out overseas daily on our behalf that we'll never hear about. But um, we should definitely be aware of trying to do everything we can to help these individuals. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, I think there should be some emphasis placed on the fact that you are, again, as you just mentioned, working with active duty service members, um, I wondered in your research, as you were looking into starting Big Sky Bravery, did you, do you did you get any sense of why that is? I mean, why there are so many um, veteran services out there and so few for active service members? You know, that's a really good question. I've actually never been asked that. Um, to start this thing, I mean, to start any nonprofit is... It's so hard. Uh, I think it's five years is what people say is, you know, you're, you're, you're credible if you hit five years. And if you don't hit five years, you're, you know, you're not. Um, I think the average nonprofit fails within uh, like 16 months. There's one survey that I saw. Sometimes it's 18 months is the average lifespan of a typical 501c3. Um, to start what I was doing, uh, it, it was so hard because not only did I had to create funding channels and I had so many donors and so many people get mad at me for starting it. And I, and I asked them why, and they're like, well, 22 veterans are committing suicide every single day. Um, you need to be giving back to them. You're, you're damaging these people's families by only bringing the operators out. You know, I've had a lot of really hateful things said to me and it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, people don't know what they don't know. Right. But, um, perception's everything. And for some of these ideas that are thrown out, um, to get to where we're at now only comes with one way, and that's trust. You know, we, we literally partner with the most sensitive units in American special operations. You know, I, I, don't, I can't really elaborate on it more than that, but... Um, all you have is your reputation and trust is everything. And to, for what we do for these, these organizations, um, they're, they're literally giving us their most important resource, which is their people. And they look at them as family. Uh, and for us to be able to partner with these units and, and you know, to, to, to be able to, to show results back to them that what we're doing actually matters. And um, some of the testimonials, or all the testimonials that we've ever gotten, um, it, it's a cause that needs to be more uh, widespread. And it's not just the units that we work with. You know, America needs to be proactive to counteract the 22 veterans um, committing suicide every day. Why not have something that's proactive instead of reactive? Why not? Why don't we look at? Um, the shortfalls in what is currently going on with our armed forces and counter counteract that with um, programs, imp implementing programs that actually show results instead of waiting until they get out. Like we need to start taking care of the, this is just me, but we need to start taking care of these individuals now, not waiting until they get out. Cause sometimes it's too late. Look at your finances. You go buy an expensive ass car, you go buy a really nice house you take a vacation, you put, you get, you know, just collect all this credit card debt or whatever. Well, next thing you know, you get that bill and you got a high burn rate of cash every single month and you can't pay it off. Now you're screwed. It's the same analogy with these, these individuals. I hate to use it, but we need to start looking at it before we buy that car, before we buy that house, before we look at credit card debt and, and start finding ways to help these people. Because when I started BSB, there's 45,000 nonprofits. Now there's over 60,000, apparently, for veterans in the United States. The suicide rate, if you look at it, hasn't moved. And it, it's moved slightly, but not enough. Not enough when you have 15,000 more nonprofits out there doing great work. I think it's time we need to be proactive. That's my rant on this whole thing. Uh, Jeremy, I, I'd love to hear your feedback on it, but I don't want to wait. You know, we need we need we need doers more than thinkers in this country right now. And luckily, I have a partner like Jeremy who uh, 
can tackle these these challenges with me, and we have a great team here. But that's Jeremy. What do you think about that? A lot to throw out there. No, no, I. I I mean, there are programs, Josh, Josh um, kind of hit on it. There's a lot of different programs that the Army, that uh, military in general has um, within, the, within its ranks to, to assist. But there's also, with everything, comes a stigma. And a, a lot of them are either going to you know, shy away from seeking this help. Um, some do confront it and are able to work through it. But then, you know, once it's repaired they get thrown right back into the meat grinder and they are expected to perform their tasks to the same level. Um, you know, when you're deploying your folks numerous times again and again and again and again, um, you know, it's not only the psychological effects of the deployment, but then the marital effects, the, the physical toll, everything just kind of compounds. And now, you know, the medical field is, you know, learning a lot with the effects of stress and how it's, you know, it can cause sleep apnea. It's causing diabetes. Like all this is leading into the, the medical side of it. You know, I, I am by no means a medical expert, but all this is being fed into it. And it's just, all these effects are just being compounded. And then, you know, the, the, the military is working through a transition program for folks, either when they end their terminal service or, they retire um, or get medically discharged. But right now it's a kind of a, it's a work in progress and what works for one person and really succeeds, isn't going to be for another. And, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all. And that's where, that's why you have so many nonprofits is what, what works for one group isn't going to work for another, but I think we've, 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 it's a, it's a much larger problem set that then people want to truly believe and want to think about right now. You know, I think you both hitting on the concept of being proactive as opposed to reactive, I think is um, really, really resonates. Uh, Jeremy, Josh mentioned the concept of, of trust and the importance of trust in Big Sky Bravery. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could talk a little about that and how that can relate to the trust that you have to have in the field um, with the people you're shoulder to shoulder with you either trust the person to your left and to the right um, or you don't and you know it takes a while to earn that trust it's not an immediate um you know you, you, you've always heard the expression you know you're going to respect the rank but you don't have to respect the man um you're going to trust that they're going to do the right thing but they have to prove it to you again and again and it just takes up one slip up on their part um, you know, falling asleep when everybody's tired or, you know, stealing some chow from you. If you're, you know, it, it happens where people will steal your chow when you're not looking. So it's kind of, but, you know, it's the little things that, and it's the little things just like in a relationship, you know, you pay attention, you, you, you work through things, you communicate. It's, it's very similar. And, you know, sometimes the bond that you form with some of the guys and gals overseas is stronger than, your marriage because of the, the, uh, the importance of what you're relying on them for. Um, and it's more of a, um, a mental connection than a, you know, physical, of course, but you know, you're, you're relying on them in so many ways that that relationship bond, uh, grows and builds. And then that's why they're so close knit when they return home, that they'd rather be with the person that shared hardships and, you know, they, there's kind of a divide there with, with their spouses as well. Uh, you know, Jeremy, war and um, some of the side effects and after effects of, of war can be hell. Uh, but, you know, is there one experience, I was curious, um, on a tour or operation that stands out to you? Um, I guess the, the, the biggest one is, you know, the, the normal deployment is, Deployments, the missions, they all kind of seem mundane. We're, we're trained for those. It's the ones that are just kind of catch you off guard. And it was a few years back, I was supposed to be out on the mission with the guys. I wasn't able to go out for a, a couple of reasons, but they got hit pretty hard. It was, uh, we had numerous uh, killed in action, multiple uh, wounded in action. And instead of being out there with them, um, 
my next step was to be at the hospital and receive everybody and receiving them into the hospital, cataloging, you know, making sure who was accounted for, who wasn't. Um, that was kind of what really stood out for me. Wow. I mean, these are your, these are more than just your friends and, and I mean, these are your, these are your brothers and sisters. Correct. It was difficult to see. It was, you know, but it was where we had to be at that time. It, you know, my time wasn't to be out on the objective. It was to be kind of bringing them through and, you know, being there for them at that point. Yeah. I'm sure that was, that was powerful. How did, how did that make you feel? How did, how did you feel um, receiving those, your friends? Truly helpless. Um, you know, I couldn't do anything for them uh, out there. So as they're coming in, you just try and comfort them, um, make sure that they're getting the appropriate care where they needed to go. Um, you know, one, one guy was just kind of had his bell rung pretty hard and he was our, he was our senior medic and he wanted to get out there and he's a big guy. He would have beat me up in a, in a heartbeat, but I had to get in his way and tell me he wasn't going back out. He, he, he wanted to go back out, but he was just in no shape. So, you know, then he was pushing past nurses, things like that. But luckily I was able to be there and, you know, stop him. And we got him the help he needed and got him squared away and then got everybody back who we could. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I can't imagine. Um, can't imagine that, you know, you, you know, you, we talked yesterday and you mentioned um, the, you know, the, the relationship component, uh, whether it's, you know, friends, family, uh, there's no planning, right? You, you don't necessarily get to say, oh, good, Christmas is coming up. I get to, I get to see my son. Correct. Um, you know, it, and we alluded to it, it's your, uh, your tempo, your, your, your training path and your training timeline is set. Um, so when you do get breaks in there, your, your block leads or your vacations, it's not, it doesn't always line up with the school or, you know, spring break, Christmas break. Um, you might be training for your kids' birthdays, things like that, where you're going to miss them. Um, so that causes a divide in the family. Um, you know, it, when you throw a, a rock in a, in, a, uh, in a pond, you get the big splash, but then there's the ripple effect. And it, it's how that kind of affects as well. And, you know, it, it takes a strong, um, strong relationship to work through all these ripples um, so you don't have a massive splash at the end. Uh, Josh, you know, I was going to ask you how individuals are selected uh, for Big Sky Bravery. That's a good question. Um, they're not for us. Uh, we send a long range calendar out. So we currently partner with uh, four different special operations units right now. And um, in those four special operations units, they're all allocated what we call our week long programs are called task forces. And uh, they actually hand select the individuals and they know need it the most. Um, I think that's one of the greatest things you know, about Big Sky Bravery. I actually remember calling Jeremy about this years ago and I had an application process up on our website. And he was just like, well, here's an idea. You know, I'm not over there with them. I'm not, I never served. I have no idea where they're at, what they're going through. You know, we, we never know what, what happens behind another man's door. Right. Um, so we know that when these guys and gals are getting off the airplane, uh, there's a story behind why they're out here. It's just up to us to figure out, you know, what role we're going to play in that in that week with them and uh it's worked out really well the last six years i hope that we uh we can continue um the same relationships that we've had and you know for decades to come because they do a really really good job of picking the individuals and um allowing us to to be paired with somebody who we know is selected it makes it a very special week for the volunteers mm -hmm. Um, Jeremy, you're working toward the end of your uh, service time. Um, you know, how much time do you have left, and, and what's on the horizon with Big Sky Bravery? Um, so currently, I've got uh, five months, just over five months. I'm in an internship um, 
uh, as I'm transitioning out of the military through um, with with Base Guy Gregory and with Josh, uh, in the hopes that that uh, you know if all the stars align that uh, I'm hired on with Josh and Big Sky Gregory staff at the end of my my internship, um, and then you know just be ready to kind of tackle the the problems that we're discussing currently um you know on this podcast with you know who to bring out in how to incorporate get uh higher donors to so we can affect and change more lives yeah back to you josh i was wondering if you could tell us some about the uh, the physical activities that that uh you bring uh these service members in. let's just put it this way if we put a fly rod in their hand on the very first day we would fail And I love fly fishing, and these guys love fly fishing. It's not that um, fly fishing doesn't have, you know, therapeutic benefits. But when when you look at how we structure the week, it's all high adrenaline-based activities up front. And sometimes it's high adrenaline-based activities the entire week. Uh, It depends on who the command team sends out. Uh, If it's a guy that's uh, in his early 30s, yeah, I mean, we're going to push him, you know, the whole week. Um, if it's an older guy, I uh, mean that like in, in, from what I've seen the career field, 40 to 50, um, we're going to do a lot more therapeutic things. So a typical week in the winter, it's, it is pretty simple because we all know that Montana is a pretty gnarly place in the winter. So we go skiing, uh, and then we go back country snowmobiling one day, we ski for three or four days. Um, through that week, we, we obviously focus on this principle called the freedom of thought, um, component which is um, getting them to do activities that require execution. You know, if they're not thinking and they're not dialed in on the double black diamond, there's some pretty high consequences with that. And, um, you know, what are the benefits that come from that? Not thinking about work, not thinking about finances, not thinking about how we all messed up our marriage, you know, or whatever. It's, it's just thinking about the task at hand, and there's a lot of therapeutic benefits with that. Uh, in the summertime, we're at the uh, the mercy of, of Mother Nature. Um, you know, we do everything from uh, extreme backcountry horse trips, um, off-road ATVs, um, fly fishing towards the end of the week in drip boats in the Yellowstone, overnight camps, um, hikes, land nav courses, shooting courses. Uh, I mean, it's it's just insane. How many how many uh, people come out at once with you guys per trip? It's a, so we have uh, five operators uh, typically that are selected for each task force, and they'll be paired with a, a volunteer. So we do one-on-one. Um, you know, we have, the guys always make fun of us. They always call us mentors. Yeah, and I don't know if we're mentors or not. I think we're just like-minded men that uh, have a true love and compassion for them and want to share the outdoors and then share our own failures and vulnerability, you know, or being vulnerable in front of them. Um, but there's always five operators uh, paired with one volunteer. So on average, we'll have uh, you know, 10 total people on a task force. You, you know, Josh, you were talking about testimonials. Um, I imagine that it's not necessarily, you know, every experience is probably different. Every person's different. Um, yeah. That it's, you know, a light bulb goes off and epiphany happens and suddenly everyone's good to go. I was going to ask you, you know, what effect has Big Sky Bravery had and how have you heard that through the people who have been through the program? The activities that we do and the way that we teach them and we, the people who teach them, you know, their paired volunteer, uh, just shows them a new, a new chapter of life. And, you know, alcohol uh, abuse is, is very prevalent in these, in these um, soft units. I've had problems with it in the past. Um, I think a lot of people have. And we don't take it away from them when they get out here. We try to show them other ways to decompress. And by the time they get home, if they have enough energy to, you know, drink a lot, then we probably didn't do our job. Uh, but not taking that away from them, just showing them other ways that are, that are healthy and effective to decompress um, and, and showing them that, you know, it's, it's fine to take time away for yourself. You know, so many guys that we've had out on these things are coming back from, you know, 14, 15 deployments, 20 years in service. And not like, I mean, it's amazing the, the percentage, I wish I had it in front of me, um, of individuals who have never taken one week of time for themselves in their entire military career. Yeah. I mean, think about the effects that not only has on the individual, but it has on their family as well. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 
it's it's an astounding thing when uh, a, a person can reflect and say, I need help. I'm going to be proactive about it. Here's some of the things that excite me. I'm going to go out. I'm going to give these 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 people a chance with the hopes of coming back, seeing a new light on things. It's not being changed for life. You know, like some people could be, but it's not about changing people for life. We're giving people a new sense of hope, peace, and restoration for their future. Whether they want to take advantage of that or not is up to them. We'll give them every tool and we will do anything for these individuals. But I think Montana is is just heaven on earth for these types of individuals. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Jeremy, how how do you, how do you feel about Montana? I um, I wanted to move out to Montana since um, since I was ten years old. My dad had. Um, it did some backpacking out here. He brought photos back of Yellowstone in the winter when you know the bison up close, and you know I've I wanted to come out here since, like I said, ten years old. Fast forward to twenty three, twenty four years old. I'm in Georgia. I meet my wife, who's I'm from New York. She was from Montana. We meet in Georgia, you know, and the rest is history. And Montana is truly. Um, I was over in Idaho for about three and a half years or two and a half years, I'm sorry. And it's got its own beauty, but there's something spectacular about Montana. Just the ruggedness, the the openness, uh, how open, wide open it is, and hence the name. But it is just, it's transformative. I want to ask you both a question. Um, maybe, Josh, we can, we can start with you. Uh, you know, 2020 was an impactful year on a lot of different levels. Um, Mm-hmm. What was it like for Big Sky Bravery uh, as the pandemic swept the world? You know, the thing about 2020 is, pandemic or not, these guys and gals still went overseas. They didn't quarantine. Right. ISIS didn't quarantine, you know. Um, all of our enemies never quarantined. They, they were still going. So, I mean, America, like I said, was still at war. As far as Big Sky Bravery goes, um, I think as a nation – uh unfortunately we've got a lot more people that deal with feelings rather than facts and um there were some some decisions made uh so for us we never shut down operations we had to we had a one veteran only non pro or one veteran only task force so guys who had been uh retired from the units that they worked with um, within the last six to 12 months uh because they didn't have a dod restriction and then uh, we got phone calls from uh, some of the units that we partnered with where their their leadership team was like, we got to start sending guys out immediately again. Like, are you guys open? And I'm like, yeah, we're open. We're ready. Like, good. We need it now. Like, we have some, some pretty um, crazy things going on, and uh, we have some people that might not make it to the end of the year if we don't run our programs. 2020 is a year that I think a lot of us learned uh, um, many things that we didn't know were there. Uh, but I do think that in the hardest of times, leaders have to lead – and have to make tough decisions, and, and they got to stand firm on their decisions, whether they fail or they, they succeed. And um, there was one family out of Chicago that uh, has been a donor for us for the last couple of years that stepped up and, and wrote us a check. That way that our offset wasn't 33% or 34%, whatever the actual number was. We might have our tribute dinner. It went all the way down to, uh, um, I think, 18%. Um, that's how big the check was. And uh, to know that there's still people out there that care not only about making sure our mission is good, but that they know that there's people fighting overseas uh, to really, you know, yeah, recheck themselves and their priorities and understand that uh, there's other things out there that need our help. Um, I think that was just one of the, the most pivotal things to me in 2020, just going through all these failures and at the end of the year having a family step up like that and, and write a check so we can maintain operations for, um, you know, the pace that we need to. I, it just there's good Americans out there. And uh, that's one of the things about 2020 that's really highlight to me, not just the negative parts. Sure. That's amazing. It's great to hear those stories. Um, you know, Jeremy, I'd love to hear from you on that. You know, how has COVID-19 affected um, your 2020 and, uh, you know, deployments and missions for um, special forces? So um, during the, the pandemic, I was uh, assigned to the ROTC at Wa- uh, Washington State still, um, but I was in close contact with, with my, my peers and the guys I worked with previously. And 
nothing really changed for them. Like as, as Josh alluded to, they were, they still had their training set, um, you know, the, the processes and how they would quarantine and the steps and the mitigating factors they would use. But in general, they, you know, I think there was a, like a two or three week shift, but other than that, everything stayed on, on schedule. We tried to keep for, um, I think everybody saw it for the mental health aspect of everybody, college students, whomever it may be. We tried to keep it as normal as possible. We would keep, we got approval for certain classes to be in person, um, different things. And, you know, zoom, uh, I think uh, you ask, what had we learned about? I, I learned about Zoom in 2020. I never knew about it before that. But, um, oh, you know, it, it uh, it's a powerful tool, but it's, you know, we're, we're human beings. We, we're, 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 uh, we're tactile. We need to touch, uh, you know, engage all six senses, not just two. And that is where a lot of is lost with Zoom and um you know, I, I understand it's where we have to be right now, but I think we need to turn out of it quicker than what people want to. I think we're all hoping uh, for fewer Zoom meetings in 2021. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, kind of winding this thing down here, you both have children. I wanted to ask you guys, you know, what is the most important lesson you've learned on this journey that you'll pass down to your kids? Um, why don't we uh, why don't we start with with you, Josh? Uh, I have a little girl and uh, prayed for a little boy. Found out I had a little girl. Was excited, but obviously, you know, every father wants a son. And when she came out, um, I've never loved anything more in my entire life. And. Um, I, I think the only thing that I would say to her is be the type of American worth fighting for. And if she needed me to elaborate on that, I, I would elaborate, but be the type of American worth fighting for. Because I know so many, I have so many brothers now, man, and uh, that I've, I've been at, at the bottom of the ravine with. And, you know, late night phone calls, uh, and just hearing the horrors of what they do, yeah, it's just heartbreaking. And uh, they're doing it for people like my my daughter and for me. And just be that be the type of person that's worth risking your life for. Sure thing. I think. Yeah. How about you, Jeremy? What would you? What are some of those lessons you've learned um, over the course of your duty, but also, you know, through this journey with Big Sky Bravery? Uh, what do you tell your kid? You know, one thing I've always, um, my, I have a 10-year-old son, and, um, you know, he's seen the deployments, the returns. He's, you know, had to see me go to, go to numerous memorials. Um, we didn't, I didn't really expose him to those. It wasn't... Um, I didn't think fair to the families, uh, but you know he understands it. He sees the the heartache my wife would go through because um, of the position I was in. She was also engaged and would receive messages. Um, so he's kind of picked up on the heartache, and you know it, it's what we all want our, our you know they to just be good humans um, and be an example for others uh, and when you could look to people, you could look to the, you know, the folks we're bringing out. Yeah, they're, they, they might be, we're all damaged in a, in a sense. We've all got cracks. Um, but when you can step past those and you don't just kind of rest and go, you know what, I'm, I sprayed my ankle. I'm not going to finish this walk or this run. No, I'm going to keep pushing through. I might be hurt, but I'm going to keep going through. I might have emotional baggage but i'm going to keep moving forward because there's a bigger task there's something bigger than myself and that's i just want him to know that there's always he's a fantastic uh young man but there's always something bigger than just the one person and i that's what i want him to know absolutely uh i think both both of your kids are going to be learning some 
some great lessons from from both you guys. Uh, Josh, you know, Big Sky Bravery is an incredible organization, and it takes a tremendous effort and significant, you know, assistance on a lot of different fronts. What can people do to help? Funding is is, is key for what we do, and. Um, if you go on our website, you, know, you can see our annual budgets and stuff and ask questions, but, you know, in, investing in, in the community, in this community that, that is continuing to fight on your behalf is something that I think everyone should be supportive of. Um, you know, funding's obviously how we, we turn the lights on, not just here, obviously, but, you know, in Big Sky and where we do all of our, our, um, task forces. Uh, another thing that, you know, you can do is, so many of these guys and gals feel forgotten and it it might be cliche to say that, but I've seen it. I've seen, you know, the testimonials, I've seen the survey results, I've seen uh, the impact that, that going over into these, you know, very classified places um, has on them. And uh, if, if you really want to show your support out and you don't have the means to, you know, to, to donate, um, write them a letter and uh, make it out to an anonymous person. Uh, you can go on our website and find our address and, uh, Jeremy and I will make sure that somebody opens that letter and that might be the saving grace for some of these people, um, or what you put in that and, uh, send it to our office. We'll make sure somebody gets it that has done extensive work on your behalf. And, um, I know they love to hear from, from civilians. Um, so write a letter to a, to an operator or his wife or his kids, or, or, you know, a female um, individual in soft, write a letter. I think that would go a long way to to, to help uh, these war fighters. They want to know that they're not forgotten. Yes, 100%. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time uh, tonight. It's been an honor chatting with you and, and really appreciate what you guys are doing and Jeremy for your service. We, we thank you. Um, Josh McCain is one of our esteemed speakers at this coming Saturday's uh, TEDx Big Sky event. Um, what Big Sky Bravery is doing is incredible and it's so important. Um, guys, I have a bit of a surprise for you. Uh, one of um, TEDx Big Sky sponsors, uh, Miller Rudell Architects, uh, has donated a $1,250 uh, check to Big Sky Bravery. And nice. Yeah. So awesome. they they love what you guys do. They are so excited to do what they can to help. Um, as are as are we. Uh, but you know, thank you on their behalf and on ours. Really appreciate you guys, your time. Yeah. Appreciate you. Um, that's that's a cool way to close it out. That's an airline ticket, and um, means a lot to us. So I appreciate you guys' support. You know who I'm talking about. Um, your checks are better than your golf game. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Um, well, this has uh, been an Outlaw Partners and Big Sky Ideas Fest event. Um, on behalf of TEDx Big Sky and Outlaw Partners, thanks. To our sponsor, um, Miller Rudell Architects, for making this interview possible. Uh, and gentlemen, thank you again for your work and your service to our heroes uh, in the military. Um, and thank you all for watching this exclusive interview with Big Sky Bravery's Josh McCain and Jeremy Keller. I'm Joe O'Connor with the Outlaw Partners. Um, tune in tonight, Wednesday, January 27th at 6 p.m. for a live streamed roundtable discussion. Uh, we're calling it the Arctic Circle to Yellowstone, a conversation about climate. Uh, this is going to be with leading experts, including Max Lowe, Kristen Gardner, Twyla Moon, and Kathy Whitlock, uh, and moderated by Mountain, uh, uh, pardon me, Mountain Journal founder and journalist Todd Wilkinson. Uh, and tune in on Saturday at 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time to watch uh, live TEDx Big Sky 2021 event called Awakening. We have nine outstanding speakers who will share some incredible stories. We hope you'll you'll join us. Thank you guys again. Take care and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks, Joe.